In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today is a story right out of the book of Genesis, and it's one that we're probably all at least somewhat familiar with. But I want to take a different look at a different side of that story, because especially in the later parts of Genesis, and this isn't something that's done as an error or a mistake, it's just the way that the book kind of goes, is that everything tends to focus on Joseph. And I want to focus on another kind of side character for the duration of this particular chaplain's report. But just so you know what's going on, the Joseph story, we all know that he was given a coat of many colors, and his brothers grew jealous, took his coat of many colors, threw him into a pit, and then eventually drew him out just to be sold off as a slave into Egypt. And what they did was they told their father that his favorite son, Joseph, had been killed. And so this all goes on. They all keep the secret. Jacob, their father, doesn't know about this. And Joseph goes through all kinds of stuff in Egypt, but eventually becomes the number two guy in the entire kingdom. Egypt is flourishing partly because of Joseph. And everybody else is going through this severe famine. So what happens is Joseph's family goes to Egypt to buy grain. They need food because they're struggling through the famine as well. And through sheer happenstance... When they come, they run into Joseph. And Joseph recognizes them, but they don't know who Joseph is because he's now dressed as an Egyptian. He doesn't look like his, himself anymore. And so they don't recognize him. So Joseph is playing this back and forth with them, and they bring his younger brother, Benjamin. And what he does is he, he plants a silver cup in Benjamin's satchel, and then he has his men go out and retrieve it and accuses his brothers of theft. Now, he's the one that put the cup there. And the whole purpose was to get the, to get the guards to bring his brothers back to him. So this is the context that they find themselves in. Here's Joseph, and Joseph at this point is holding all the cards. He knows what all is going on here. He's the one that set this whole thing up. None of the brothers understand that or know that. And all the other brothers know is that somehow this very expensive silver cup wound up in Benjamin's bag. And so this is the part of the story that I really want to focus on, where the brothers are not sure how they're going to get out of this mess. All they know is that their father, who has already lost one son, is now about to lose his other favorite son, his little brother. And so... This particular passage is, is really where we're going to start. This comes from Genesis chapter 44, verses 31 through 34. And it reads, When he, talking about his father here, uh, this is Judah speaking, When he sees that the lad is not with us, he will die. Thus your servants will bring the gray hair of your servant, our father, down to Sheol in sorrow. For your servant became surely that for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then let me bear the blame for my father forever. Now therefore, please let your servant remain, instead of the lad, a slave to my lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to the father if the lad is not with me? For fear that I see the evil that would overtake my father." Now, I want you to try to put yourself in Judah's shoes, and I think that that'll be a little bit easier when you understand the kind of person that Judah has been up to this point. Judah is a very flawed individual. His brothers look up to him. He's kind of seen as, oddly enough, somewhat of a leader amongst his brothers, despite the fact that he's not the oldest. Reuben is the oldest. But he's not the most responsible man. After one of his or after two of his sons died while they were married to Tamar, he kind of abstained from his responsibility to make sure that Tamar had somebody to take care of her 
and just kind of abandoned her, honestly. And so he had a bad habit of doing this, and, and he also was not very responsible with Joseph. You know, when they threw Joseph in the pit, it was Reuben that said, no, let's not kill him. Because everybody else wanted to kill him, including Judah. They wanted to murder their own brother out of jealousy. And if it hadn't been for Reuben, they probably would have. And so Judah has not been the best big brother, to say the least. And he's not always done exactly the right thing either. And here, we see Judah willing to sell himself into slavery for a crime that, as far as he knows, was committed by somebody else. You see, I think we see a lot of character growth in Judah. Going from somebody that was willing to kill his own little brother out of petty jealousy to somebody that is willing to give his own life to protect his brother and to make sure that his brother and father could be with each other once again. It really does show how life can change people. How Judah, who up until this point has lived not a model life to say the least, is willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. Now, the older translations will say give life to. It's probably a better translation to say that he was going to be an indentured servant to Joseph that entire time because of the Hebrew word that's used there. But either way, Judah is willing to give up his life to become a slave to Joseph, who he doesn't know is Joseph, just to protect his family. That takes an, an amazing amount of courage. And we see how Judah has come a very long way in the span of his life. And maybe part of the reason that he did is because he recognized that he made some pretty significant mistakes in the past. And now it's time for him to do the right thing. And another thing that has always astounded me about biblical study is how much of the Bible foreshadows. And I think you can't find a better example of that anywhere in the scripture than right here. Here we have an older brother that is willing to give up his life to make up for the crime that was committed by his younger brother. Now, Benjamin was innocent, but he doesn't know that. For all he knew, Benjamin really did steal the cup. Didn't matter to Judah. He was willing to become Joseph's slave to make that right, regardless. And what did he sacrifice himself for? Well, in part to protect Benjamin, sure. But so that Benjamin, the son that, at least in Judah's eyes, has committed a crime can be restored to a relationship with their father. I mean, that's as good an analogy for what happens to Christ later in the Bible as any you'll ever find. Where we have our older brother, Jesus, and that's very well established, especially in the book of Hebrews, that Jesus Christ is the firstborn of the dead. He is our older brother, gave up his life so that we could find atonement for our sins, the sins that were separating us, from our Heavenly Father. You see, the goal of Jesus' mission was reconciliation of his father and his younger siblings. Ultimately, when you boil it right down, that's what Jesus came to earth to do, to make sure that his father could be with his children. And he was the only one that could do that. And here in the story of Judah, we see exactly the same thing taking place. His love for his father and his love for his little brother outweighs his love for himself. And ultimately, that's the reason Jesus is able to make the sacrifice that he does. Because he loves his father so much and he loves all of us so much that he wants us to be able to be together again. That is an amazing summary of the gospel of Jesus Christ contained as early as the book of Genesis. This was always part of God's plan. God always knew that. And I think that that's why he puts little stories like this in the scripture to prepare the way and to prepare the world for the story of a redeeming Savior.
Stay the course, friends. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them. I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.